exist to destroy our community and yet we're still here. So obviously there's a lot of power in the work that we bring to the table. Um, yeah. There is a, a lot of judgment sometimes um, in terms of the engagement of communities of color on the climate change issue um, without an understanding that um, we don't get to choose between racial violence and police misconduct and climate change. That our communities exist at the intersection of all of it and that our capacity is, is literally spent on working on all kinds of issues from displacement to police misconduct to educational challenges in terms of the resources that exist in our schools or don't exist in our schools, uh, to the lack of employment opportunities. We live at the intersection of injustice and climate change. And so building just relationships becomes really challenging when people want to rush ahead without really thinking how these issues show up in our communities. And so this panel has been working really hard to make sure that it is a priority on a local level, on a national level, and, and, and on a statewide level. So I'd like, you, I'd like now to open up questions. I'm sure this is a very big group of people, and I know that you guys, I, I feel, it feels very hot in here. Uh, so I'm gonna ask one more time, how many people think that climate change is the most urgent issue in our time? No, nada? Where are you all coming from? You weren't affected by Sandy. Um, just, I also want to use another example, and, and I almost forgot about this, about Katrina, what happens in New Orleans, because um, right now at Sunset Park, we're faced with a, prop, with a proposal for a streetcar um, without any kind of community engagement in this process at all. This was a, a developer-driven, funded initiative that was supported by the mayor. Uh, because now they see the possibility of uh, displacement in this community and they want to support it. Same thing happened in New Orleans where black communities that have been there historically are now being displaced as a result of Katrina and they are now suddenly getting all of these transportation and, uh, um, amenities into their community. So displacement and climate change are connected and amenities coming into our communities to basically provide green not cool resources to the privilege that are moving into into New York City um, is is a real crisis for our communities, and we can't. It's very difficult to be able to work on climate change while at the same time working on issues of displacement, and they're completely connected. So working at the intersectionality of all of those issues is the charge for those of us that are working on climate justice, and I think that um, you uh, reflect. Uh, how that is happening on a lot of different levels. So I want to take questions. Um, let me put up my glasses so I can see you right now. You all look like a beautiful Monet painting. <laughs> okay, so any questions? All the way in the back with the white sleeves. Do, do any of our organizations collaborate with um, people in the public health realm? And if so, what does that collaboration entail? What do you guys want to do? Do any of your organizations collaborate with people in the public health realm? In the public health realm. And if so, what is the nature of those collaborations? And sort of what are, what are you guys working towards to sort of um, gauge the terminology there between the two fields? When you get up, also tell them who you are. Do you really want me to do that? Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Brett Promislav. I'm a student to be graduate of Pratt City Regional Planning Program, and my thesis works at the intersection of environmental justice and health disparities in children in Bushwick on Hope Gardens in the public housing campus. Thank you. Well, the environmental justice movement comes out of um, our community's concern with the public health disparities that exist in our communities all over the United States. Uh, the movement literally started because our people were dying from PM 2.5, Knox, Sox, the fact that we were uh, the, unrelu the unreluctant host to all of the environmental burdens that serve privileged communities. And it is an issue that has more to do with race and less to do with class. And so there is complete, a complete nexus between public health and environmental justice. And I think that in all the communities that you all work, whether it's with the people in Black Mesa, to the folks in Richmond that are surrounded by fracking, uh, to Sunset Park. I, I don't know if you want to share a little bit about that. Sure, I can talk about Sunset Park. Um, 
a lot of our, some of our residents actually work in the fields of public health, either nurses or public health um, research. And uh, there are not a lot of health facilities in Sunset Park. That's one of the struggles that we deal with, although there's a lot of public health issues. One of the members who have worked with UpRose for a very long time works with one of the, the health care facilities, and she knows firsthand from seeing patients come in over the years that the most patients that are hospitalized for asthma, lung disease, or who are being treated for cancer live closest to the industrial waterfront. They live closest to the Gowanus Expressway, and that's, that's not a coincidence. There is a high rate of cancer, asthma, lung disease in Sunset Park, but there is an even higher concentration the closer you get to the industrial facilities. And so it's important to have those relationships with people who work in the field because they've got the data and the research to prove our point, making the connection between environmental hazardous exposure and health problems. I don't know if you want to talk about California or, or some of the communities that are facing a lot of health disparities as a result of a legacy of environmental abuse. Yeah, I always want to talk about California, <laughs> just in general. Um, but actually what I was thinking of is I was just in Flint, Michigan, supporting some of the organizing mayor around the water crisis. Um, and it's actually, that current organizing table is a really good example of when public health, environmental justice, climate justice, uh, labor, and you know political organizing is all sitting at a table and actually I mean, agreeing on things to some degree, but I think in the crisis moment, too, of actually realizing firsthand where your organizing and your constituency lies across the, the obvious and immediate impact of what the crisis is. Um, so yeah, I think there's, like public health, I think, is a part of all, like a lot, if not all, of our organizing focuses when you're building collective and intersectional strategies together around the human impact side of environmental and climate crises. Um, and that was, yeah, so Flint, Michigan is a pretty good example of where a lot of the public health, environmental justice, and climate justice folks are leading that charge. And part of your question was, I'm sorry, part of your question was about collaborating. Um, and we do collaborate not only with public health institutions, we get funding from SEP, for example, from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And Eddie Bautista, who's here from the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, an alliance that we belong to, has done several presentations for 1199 the nurses union, uh, all of these health practitioners um, are really concerned about not only the disparate siting of these facilities in our community, but what climate change is actually going to mean to communities that are particularly vulnerable because they are part of a community of people that generation after generation has had access to the worst food, the worst health care, has had stress over a period of generations that, you know, we're talking about epigenetics here. So if you talk, if you have a community that has been stressed over generations and has had to deal with the kind of stress associated with racism and with not having the things that you need for, for human life, you have a community that is particularly susceptible to disease. And what does that mean when you have extreme, recurrent extreme weather events? What does that mean when you're living next to um, industry that has all kinds of contaminants, of toxins and toxicants that become airborne in the middle of an extreme weather event? Those are things that we're doing locally. We're studying those things, um, but that's a that's a discussion for another day. But health is at the heart of a lot of the work that we do. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Just one quick comment. If my memory serves me correctly, and there are a couple of timers directly come on. I believe the planning profession itself got started after there was a typhoid epidemic in England, and they found that it was sourced to a well in a low income area. So this issue that we're talking about today, in many ways, is a historical precedent for a lot of us being in the room. And uh, it really is a critical issue, the intersection between health, environmental justice, poverty, displacement, as you uh, say, uh, mentioned. Uh, you know, one of the great books by, uh, 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 by
that to, in many ways is bringing us back to our fundamental roots. Thank you. And really important for you as students of planning to understand the role that planners play in this movement. Um, because it, you're really divided into the group that has this vision that you've been thinking about your entire life and you're a good person and you want to go into a community and tell them this is the way it's going to be. And people in our communities push you back and say, oh, hell no, we got some ideas about not only what we want to see happening here, but how we can use your services. And so that's where the environmental justice community is. We really need your support and your help. We need to understand zoning, permitting, youth all of that. It's at the heart of the work that we're doing around climate change. But we let you know how we need your services. And so the idea that you come in uh, with this dream that you've had your whole life and, and, and take a you know, crayon and, and, and design uh, routes for us and tell us where speed bumps should be and neck downs, um, that's, uh, that's planning from another time. And so that's not this time that we're living in. It's going to require a different kind of planner, a planner who understands that the future is about how you bring people together from different backgrounds and respect the grassroots. Any, any other questions? Yes. And I, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. The topic of intersectionality and like public health and all these other things has come up, and I kind of want to let, like, have do this for another minute or so because I think when Elizabeth was saying how many of you think climate justice is the most important issue right now and there's a lot of like new form hands like to be real not that long ago I wouldn't have put my hand up as well and I think what the like the in the interest of talking about intersectionality when we are talking about climate justice what we are talking about is racism and classism and poverty and environmental health and public health and all of that displacement and gentrification and so, like, in my, so I, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I'm sure folks know California right now is experiencing the worst drought in recorded history. And that's a really big deal because now water, which is something we all need, is something that's becoming, like, you know, a finite resource. And when that happens is they try to, they moderate your water usage, and whatever you go over or, or over your usage is now taxed. So the climate impact being the drought is a now waging a class war. So low-income communities in Los Angeles don't have readily ac like accessible water at that point. And that's a really big deal. And that's not something that I would have known a while ago that that was a climate crisis. That's climate change right there. And that's actually a lot of things like, or that's something that a lot of folks that I grew up with are like my family. My mom probably wouldn't have even until recently been like, you know, on that climate justice tip until she's realizing that you know, the impacts like hit really close to home. And then what happens when there's a drought is wildfire season happens a lot sooner than it should be. And then we don't have the resources to stop the wildfires. And then, you know, what are the, the communities that are not at the waterfront at the beach are the ones up in the hills. And those are the communities that are going to be hit with the wildfires. Those are, and then you have a, like a displacement and a climate migration conversation about where those people who don't have any money are supposed to go live and recreate their lives. And so I think, um, I just want to like bring that back into the room because I don't think that's a, that this is about like climate change and parts per million and like degrees of warming, but also like we are talking about what capitalism is, and I think it is very important to know that like whether you're talking about racial justice, economic justice, gender justice, all of the justices and isms um, have a climate impact. It, it is sometimes an uncomfortable conversation, but one that has to be had. Uh, back there. Hi, um, I'm one of uh, my students at that grant, and I have a question, you know, we're, we're talking about capitalism, we're talking about this injustices, and I totally agree. Oh, first of all, thank you all for coming and spending your Friday with us, it's really great to be here. Um, but, you know, um, my question, you know, bringing back this on more of a scientific level, um, we're, we're talking about consumerism, and aren't we being a little hypocritical? in some sense because we're all here, we're all wearing nice clothes, probably made in a foreign country, and we're spending money on takeout that is delivered to our door. And all of these things that we do, is there a point where um, you think we'll have an allotment limiting the amount of things we may consume during the day? Um, because to me, I mean, how do you live a meaningful life? Because even art or painting or sculpture is contributing to entropy and enthalpy. So it's we're contributing to carbon emissions no matter what we do, no matter 
you know, our very breath is contributing to carbon emissions. So how can we live meaningful lives, having art, being pleasurable, going out and seeing people? Um, how do we live meaningful lives and be environmentally just to others who are in uh, vulnerable? Yeah, I mean, I'll give a sh short response that could explode, but I'm trying to slow it. Keep myself. Uh, I just think the paradigm you're in of, of austerity is wrong, right? New York State has enough money, right? period. End of discussion. The United States has enough money. New York City has enough money. That if we made the decision tomorrow to be carbon neutral, to help ensure that everybody had good health care, that we had public health workers in every neighborhood making sure, like, we could do that. We make policy decisions, every one of us, right, individually and collectively, that lead to other people's deaths, right? And, and we all need to own that, right? And it's very easy to have the right ethics. It's very hard to change practices when you're in a system. I can't choose to not be part of a system of white supremacy or capitalism, right? You can't. I have friends from college who literally went off and lived in the woods, and a couple years later they came back, because you know what happens? You get sick and you need to go to the hospital, right? right? So I just think, my answer, right, and there's a lot of possible answers to that, is we just, if we accept the logic that every action we have takes away from other people, that there's a zero sum, we've lost our rhythm. I, I want to say something about consumption culture, because um, we are living at a time where the majority is becoming people of color, and I'm a little angry that at the moment that we become the majority, suddenly people who have had to struggle with so little for so long can't have those things because the people who put them in that situation in the first place now are denying them the ability to live the kind of life that they have earned. And so there's this judgment implicit in the choices that people make. Um, there was a woman uh, I met many years ago. I was on a panel with this guy from NRDC and she came up to the mic and she said, I buy so many shoes, why do I need so many shoes? And I said, because you never had them before and you want them because you never had them and now you can have them. And people who have cars in the houses in the country and have privilege, they can go around looking beat, by the way, because we have to dress up as people of color, otherwise we're not respected when we walk into a room. But you, you want those things because you never had them. Unfortunately, climate change is now telling us that we have to live with what we need and not with what we want. And that is not something that you created or your ancestors created. That was done by some of the people that are on the days. So I would be real careful with asking the question only because we find that too with people who ride a bicycle who suddenly think that because they're riding a bicycle, even though they're rolling over our elders in our communities, uh, and we see them as rolling gentrification often, that they think that they're saving the planet by doing just that one act. And that's a very good act and an important one. But it is a judgment of the folks that are not doing it and the people of color who are struggling in those communities with an understanding that the choices that people in our community are making for a lot of different reasons, they're making them because history put them in that position. So we need to be very careful. The other thing is that when we blame it on the consumer, you take away the blame from the corporations and those multinationals that are really contributing to all of the emissions that are killing us. So I just, just, just as a, uh, I'll just, you know, I'll just say be careful with that. But I know there are other hands up, and that was a multi-part question. Yeah, also, can I just wanted to also respond? Yes, yes. I would like to say something about capitalism, economics, and imagination. Capitalism is a system that's human-made. Economy is a human-made science. It's not like biology and chemistry where you can't change it. We created capitalism. People created communism and socialism. We can create another ism. We are capable, very smart people. We can put our heads together and create a new kind of economy. Perhaps one that we've never seen before, that has never been tried out before. And that would mean thinking drastically differently. It could mean getting rid of borders, creating new. It could mean working collectively. It could mean consensus-driven communities. And I, I like the fact that, Elizabeth, you mentioned the corporations and responsibility really needs to go back to corporations. This idea of planned obsolescence is disgusting and insulting. The fact that you, you buy a product and it is deliberately designed to fail within a year so you have to go out and buy another one. That is not the fault of the consumer. We have to hold the big people responsible for the climate crisis that we're in accountable. It is not enough for us to individually say, well, I'm going to 
not buy new clothes this year. And that, that's fine. That's, that's a good, honorable choice to make if that's what you want to make. But that doesn't make a dent in the crisis that we find ourselves in. The corporations who have led us to this crisis, they're the ones responsible. They're the ones who we have to hold accountable. Well, a couple of weeks ago, a number of us were in Cuba, and a number of us are going there in a couple of weeks, actually a week from Sunday. One of the groups that we're meeting with is the, I, I think it's the Antonio Nunez Jimenez Foundation, the man in the environment. Uh, and it's a very interesting group because what they're doing is they're working with residents in Havana and in the rural urban areas to really redefine what wealth is. What does it really mean to be wealthy? Uh, and it, it's looking at everything from uh, basically to look at the future in a way uh, that they can accept and improve the quality of life for people, but not necessarily move to an area of uh, recycled consumption, to pick up on your point. Like the, uh, what you're saying, I'm from Los Carabos in the Bronx. Uh, Cuba, and I went there uh, seven years ago, is the old, 90% of its food is all organically grown. And you have people from all over the world who visit Cuba to look at that system and to try to bring that system back home. The United States has totally ignored it. Okay, and the United States refuses to acknowledge that agricultural structure. That's an environmental crime all by itself. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of things that we have to address. Interesting. Okay? Especially when it comes, I'm sorry, but especially when it comes to people of ethnicity. Okay, uh, Cuba has expanded into Africa and the Congo and has bought that organic gardening structure. Everybody in Cuba in their houses have a garden and they're able to use that food. And it, it's, it's considered to be a worldwide example. At the Paris Forum, they did touch on that. Okay, but the only ones that refuse to hop on that van is uh, the United States of America. Okay, so, so it, is, it is a racial issue, yeah. and it is a combination of other issues that really have not been addressed. Yeah, we also know that the Cubans right now, one of the things that they're saying is that they are so being influenced by U.S. Um, by U.S. influence that they're thinking that their, their way of surviving has become outdated when what we have to learn is to become more like them. Um, let me, I just, I just have one question that I should have asked you and didn't. Uh, any reflections on this year's election and how climate justice activists are engaging? No? Laughter. <laughs> Um, I mean, my quick answer to that too is like, yes, I think election year is big and it takes a lot of capacity and it takes a lot of resources and a lot of our conversations are shaped towards the election and whatnot. Um, it's actually really hard, I've found, to mobilize communities in a real way on wanting to work on the election because a lot of folks are like, why don't we turn out the vote? And you're like, yeah, we should turn out the vote, but it's also really hard to motivate people on voting within a corrupt system. And so the system is what we're trying to change, and the system is what needs to change. We're not going to vote our way out of that. So I think with, with the climate, like there are climate voters, and there are politicians who are better on climate and worse on climate, and I think there's a very real reality with what that means for now, but the long-term solution is not working within the same corrupt systems and electing different, maybe better people to be within that same corrupt system, but actually looking at the system change. Um, I want to make one comment about to go back to that, that there's a difference